Hey everyone, today we are talking about the top tips on buying a home here in the state of Maryland. So uh, when you think about buying a home, I, you know, I can certainly tell you it won't be the uh, easiest thing you ever do in your life. It's, it's definitely filled with, you know, there, there's a lot of things that go into it. So i um, hoping to just share a few things today with you. Hopefully you can take away one or two things that uh, might make this process just a little less stressful for you um, as you prepare and kind of consider um, if purchasing a home is right for you uh, and your family. Uh, so we're going to talk about that today and let's get started right now. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Living in Maryland channel where we talk about all things living here in the state of Maryland. So if that's the kind of information you're looking for, make sure to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell so you're notified of our new weekly videos where we talk about all things Maryland. And if you ever have any questions about moving here to the area, uh, we absolutely love taking your calls, love answering your text messages and emails. So feel free to reach out to us anytime and days, nights, and weekends. We got your back when moving here to the state of Maryland. All right, so first off, I want to start with talking about the, the loan process, the, the pre-approval process, and, and that's going to be something that I want to hit on just a little bit today for you. Um, and first off, I want to start with just kind of how getting a loan these days can, can kind of be a pain in the butt, you know, so I definitely want you to, you know, know that going into it, um, because a lot of buyers, I think they figure that out once they're already in it and they, they kind of, they're, they're already in the deal. Um, and then they get that stress that comes on and they, a lot of buyers, you know, I try to prep people for this up front, but I think a lot of buyers, they kind of reach a breaking point at, at a certain point, you know, lenders ask for so much uh, documentation, so many things to, to get financing, um, for all loans. And, and it's something that I just like to prepare people for. So if you can know that going into it, at least you can expect it and kind of know that it's coming and hopefully it won't be. Um, as stressful and it's something that you can plan for. So first off, I want to go over a couple of things as far as just how these loans work, just so you can kind of know the background and know what you're what you're walking into. Um, so 95 plus percent of loans out there, if you are getting financing for a home purchase, you're going to get either a conventional loan, an FHA loan, or a VA loan. There's going to be some USDA out there too, which is like rural housing. And every single one of those type of loans is going to be federally insured um, by different you know, segments of the government. So FHA is HUD, Housing and Urban Development. Um, conventional is going to be either Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, both um, kind of institutions of the federal government. And then VA is going to be the Veterans Administration. And um, what's the other one I mentioned? USDA is going to be, you know, federal as well. So what that means is that for each and every single one of those loan types, the federal government is setting forth um, the, the loan provisions, the, the loan guidelines for what is required in order for that loan to, to be given by the bank. So it doesn't matter if you're dealing with Chase, Wells Fargo, a local bank in the state, whether you're in California, Maryland, New York, um, these guidelines are federal. So that's what I, I kind of like to tell people that, especially when I have buyers and they're kind of starting the process, like I'm, I tell them like, look, they're not picking on you. Um, these loans are all federally insured. And what that means is that the when the lender um, it, you know, processes your loan and closes your loan, immediately that loan is sold to, whether it's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, HUD, um, immediately is sold to the, to the federal government and then they you know, do whatever they do. It goes on the secondary market, the bond market, whatever it is, that gets kind of complicated. Um, but immediately it's sold to the federal government. So that's why these lenders are so strict because if they do not follow the guidelines, the government can kick that loan back and then those banks have to carry that paper and that's not something that they're in the business for. They're in the business of making loans, getting reimbursed right away so they, they can just kind of keep keep going and keep that process rolling. So if you're feeling that stress or if you're noticing, you know, they ask for so much, that is why. All these loans are federally insured and that they're just going down that, that checklist uh, that the government requires. Now, of course, there's things called overlays. Overlays are... Um, things that the specific bank, uh, the individual lender you're working with is is uh, requesting above and beyond the federal guidelines. But for the most part, you know, COVID, we definitely saw some additional over overlays. Those are starting to soften. Um, so for the most part, there's not a ton of those because the guidelines are pretty pretty in depth, uh, you know, from the from the government. So, but that's kind of how that process works. So if you're wondering you know, why they're asking for so much, uh, you know, that's, that's why. So all these loans are, 
uh, going through that process. And, uh, and, and that's what's going to happen whenever you get one of those federally insured loans. And almost everybody, very few people are getting kind of what's called a portfolio loan through a, through a bank. A portfolio loan through a bank would be like if you go to Bank of America and they have their own specific uh, mortgage that they are actually going to hold. Um, now, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, a lot of times they will retain the loan for the servicing purposes, but they're still almost always selling that loan on the secondary market to the government as soon as you close. If you're using conventional FHA or VA, which is almost everyone. And then next, just to jump into the pre-approval process. So I, I think this is definitely a good place to start. If you're considering purchasing a home, if you want to jump into the market, um, you know, I, I definitely do believe that this is a good place to start and not just to satisfy like a realtor. A lot of realtors will ask you for a pre-approval letter before they want to show you homes, before, before they want to meet with you. That is not what I am talking about here. I think that there's specific benefits to the buyers uh, to, to start here. And I want to kind of just give you a few reasons for why that is. Um, so when you're getting a, a mortgage, they are paying attention to what's called your debt to income ratios. There's a few things that they're paying attention to, but the debt to income ratios are a big one. So when you're going to speak to a lender, um, there's a few things that you want to, that I suggest, um, or at least, you know, that I think you should talk to them about. And one is going to be what you can get approved for based on a monthly payment that you're comfortable with. So when you go to get a, a mortgage, there's a few things, you know, the bank will lend you maybe 500000 right? But the, there's always a difference between what the bank will lend you and what you actually want to spend. And what you actually want to spend is almost always less than what they'll approve you for. So that's something that you uh, definitely want to talk to them about. And that's something that I'm always telling people to focus on is have that discussion with the lender where, you know, where's that cap of whether it's 2,500 bucks a month, right? Have that conversation between you, if it's just you or you and your spouse, having that conversation of what is our max monthly payment that we are comfortable with and we're not willing to go above X, whatever that is, and having that conversation with the lender so your pre-approval can be built around that. And that way you're not looking at homes where if your max payment that you're comfortable with is 2,500, that way you're not looking at homes where that payment's going to be 2,800, 2,900 bucks a month. And that can just kind of help, um, you know, keep things in reality for you so you're not feeling stressed out and that payment just continues to get stretched. So that's something that I recommend uh, for all buyers when they're going through that pre-approval process. The other reason that I recommend going through that process in the beginning is because um, the payment is really what you want to focus on. If you are looking at, you know, if your budget is $300,000, right? If you're in maybe a townhome market, but maybe there's condos as well, um, that that price point, that just the sales price can be very misleading. So if you're looking at a home that's got a, a, a condo fee, well, condos almost always in Maryland, they're going to average about a $300 monthly condo fee a $300 monthly condo fee is going to yield about $60,000 in purchase price. So what that means is you can buy a $300,000 condo for the same price that you can buy, sorry, for the same payment that you can buy a $360,000 townhome for. That's what that condo payment would represent in purchase price. So that's uh, definitely a big reason to focus on the payment. And also property taxes vary from county to county. Um, depending on the year the home was built. So if you're paying specifically attention just to the sales price, that could uh, just not paint that full picture of where you really should be looking at um, homes and the pricing of the homes that you should be looking at. So that's something I always recommend as well. If you are self-employed, uh, I definitely believe the earlier the better. Um, that's definitely a process you want to start right away because when you're self-employed, so you know myself being in real estate, um, we're considered self-employed. We're 1099 independent contractors. So when you are in any um, way of that kind of employment, they've got to review your your tax returns. They've got to dive into. You know, they usually need a P and L. Um, there's certain things that they need to meet those government um, guidelines. So that's something you want to start as early as possible. If you are a W two employee. Um, those are just much more straightforward. So it's still something that I think there's benefits for for the buyer to start early, but it's going to be much cleaner and much easier um, than if you're self-employed. Self-employed, they're just going to need so many more things. They're going to need, you know, they might need a year of bank statements to to kind of show all that income. So if you're self-employed, I just think that's on top of of the other reasons I stated. One more reason to start that process earlier, just so there's no hiccups once you get a contract on a home. And that the way these, these lenders uh, work as far as the approval process, 
you are getting a pre-approval or a pre-qualification, sometimes those are used interchangeably, um, from a loan officer, a mortgage loan officer. So they are not an underwriter. So all these lenders, they do not send a file to underwriting until you actually have a contract on a home. And the underwriters are the ones who are putting, you know, your whole file under a fine, you know, under a microscope. They're looking for issues. They're looking for, um, you know, ways that maybe your file is not meeting um, those those guidelines set forth by the government. Um, and so sometimes the, you know, issues don't arise until you're under contract and that can create a problem where you're already, you've already submitted earnest money on a home, you know, you've already got paid for inspections. So as thorough as you can be up front, I think that's in the buyer's best interest. So you don't waste time, money and effort, um, looking at homes and going through that process, unless you know, uh, that you can, you know, make it to the, to the closing table. So another thing, uh, to kind of pay attention to. Uh, when you're going through that pre-approval process. All right, next I want to talk about inspections and just kind of some, some thoughts there so you know what to expect specific to Maryland. So in Maryland, once you get a contract on a home, it's uh, inspections are almost always timelined. So you are going to have you know a, a set amount of days from the date that the uh, seller accepts your offer. Um, and then usually that's seven days, 10 days, you know, that that's kind of a common time frame. So then that's the amount of days that you have to do any and all inspections um, that are within the contract that you're allowed to do. And uh, that's going to be your contingency period. So that's something to expect that your inspections are going to have a timeline uh, on them. Common inspections that we do here in Maryland are your general home inspection. Uh, we call them our contract refers to them as a structural mechanical inspection. Those are going to be top to bottom. They're going to check, you know, the roof, the attic, all the way down to the basement, foundation, exterior, um, and all those items. So that's something that you definitely want to do that we highly recommend for all buyers. Um, a couple other health and safety things that we recommend is Maryland does have radon gas. So that's something that we recommend that people inspect for, especially if you got a family and, and it can be anywhere within Maryland, whether there's a basement, whether there's not a basement. Um, so that's something that we always recommend because it can be totally random. So uh, there's no really, uh, you know, areas that are more likely to have it. It's just something that we that we do have all throughout the state. So that's something that I would recommend. Um, and then termite. Termite's very, very affordable. It's usually, depending on the inspection company, it's about 35 to 60 bucks um, to get a wood destroying, um, you know, uh, insect inspection and see if there's any termite activity in the home that you're under contract on. So that's something that we highly recommend. Uh, the VA loan for veterans is the only one that requires a termite inspection for financing. Conventional FHA, they don't require it. So that's just, you know, only if the buyer asks for it or if they're, if it's recommended by their realtor. So that's something that you definitely want to pay attention to because if you're, if you're going through conventional FHA, the lender's never going to ask you for one. So that's just something you want to be prepared for so that you tell uh, the seller and your realtor that that's something that you want to do. The next thing that I like to do, if possible, um, I like to tell the buyer to wait to order the appraisal um, until you've made it kind of through your inspections. And the reason for that, and that's hard to do in certain markets, especially right now when things are so competitive and you've kind of got to, you know, you've got to, you know, move through the process uh, quickly. But if possible, I like to do that. And the reason for that is once that appraisal is conducted by the appraiser, the appraiser has to go out to the property and do, you know, a physical inspection of the property, check that the utilities are on and that the home, you know, has meets certain condition criteria. But once they go out to that property, uh, you're going to have to pay for that for that appraisal and appraisals are running 550 bucks to 600 bucks. So, um, you know, if you go to a home inspection and there's, you know, the deal's not going to make it through and that appraisal's already been done, you're gonna be stuck with paying for that appraisal. So that's something, if you can, just kind of waiting to make sure that uh, the inspection's good, that you've got the green light, that you're moving forward in that regard, and then having that appraisal done. So that's something, if possible, that I like to, to have the buyer be aware of and try to do. So the next tip for buying a home in Maryland is uh, definitely, if possible, I recommend driving through the neighborhood, driving by the home, um, you know, before going to see it, if possible. I know that sometimes this is tough to do, um, but there's certain things that I like to pay attention to and I like to look for, you know, if there's must haves on your list. So I know when my wife and I were looking to buy our home several years ago, there was certain things, you know, in the neighborhood or in the, the, the exterior property itself that I was always looking for. Like I didn't want a home on a shared driveway, right? And we see a lot of those throughout uh, central Maryland. I didn't want a home with, you know, buried in trees, you know, too many trees around. So that's something that I like to look for. 
Um, so there's certain things that, uh, you know, especially as photography and, and technology continues to grow, that they are, uh, they're good at hiding, right? So they're, if you're scrolling through those pictures, they're, you, that they're not going to really show you sloping yards is another thing that, that some people are concerned about with, you know, the rain and potential flooding and stuff like that. So, you know, they're not, they're not going to show that stuff in the photos. So those are certain things that by driving by the home, driving through the neighborhood in person and having boots on the ground, that those are things you can get ahead of and see and just make sure that that's a property that you definitely want to check out. Um, so because sometimes we drive up to the home and uh, it's like then buyers don't even want to go into it because of a, a certain thing, you know, in the neighborhood or a certain thing on the exterior of the home. So that's just a way where you can kind of maximize your time and efforts if you're able to, to do that. Next tip I like to give people is, um, if possible, uh, if you're able to use conventional financing, I think that that's definitely, for the most part in general, going to be in the buyer's best interest. So if you're a veteran, VA loan's great. Um, you know, you can, I think it's if you're over 10% disabled, you can get that funding fee waived. So that's a huge benefit. And VA loans have... Uh, I uh, have no PMI, so that's a huge benefit. But when you, um, if you're not a veteran, if you are looking, most people are going to have two options, FHA and conventional. So if you look at those two side by side, FHA is going to be a much more expensive loan. So it's going to have an upfront, uh, what's called an upfront mortgage insurance fee, and that's going to be 1.75% of the loan amount. And that's going to be tapped uh, or wrapped into your loan when you close. Um, so depending on what your price point is, that can be a, you know, a good chunk of change. So that's something that conventional one does not have. Um, FHA's monthly uh, PMI, PMI is private mortgage insurance. And all that is, is the buyer paying money for an insurance policy to protect the bank against buyer default. So anytime there's less than 20% down, that, that in some fashion is going to be required to protect the bank since you only have so much equity into the home going into that purchase. So FHA is gonna be more expensive mainly for those two reasons. That PMI is gonna be 0.85% of the loan amount um, for the life of the loan. And that's something where conventional just has so much more flexibility in regards to mortgage insurance. Um, they've got buyout options. So you, if you have you know extra cash, you can buy it out in a lump sum at closing. You can do lender PMI. You can kind of wrap, I think you can wrap it into the interest rate, take a little bit of a higher interest rate. And you can also pay it monthly as you would with FHA. And on average, from the lenders that I talked to, um, PMI, through conventional financing can be typically around half the cost of FHA. So if, if you're able to go conventional, uh, we typically see that that's, uh, that's something that the buyers tend to go, that it's more favorable and in their interest to do so. And in order to do that conventional, um, you know, you're gonna wanna have stronger credit. So that's something you wanna really pay attention to. Typically over 700 is gonna be kind of where you wanna be. And the reason for that is that conventional tiers their mortgage insurance based on the client's credit. So if you've got 620 credit, mortgage insurance is going to be so much more expensive than if you have a 720 or, you know, an 800 or something like that. So that's why credit's extremely important when it comes to conventional. So that's something you want to pay attention to. Um, if you're able to kind of focus on that. So conventional is at least an option for you when you get to that uh, point of uh, looking over financing options and kind of taking that next step. Next piece of advice is gonna to be to hire a realtor. So in Maryland, I can't speak for all states, but in Maryland, I'll just kind of give you a breakdown of how that works and our um, our agency laws here in Maryland. So I think it was around 1999 or the year 2000, Maryland came out with buyer agency. And, and basically what that did is it allowed the buyer to have, um, it made it very clear and definitive that the buyer was entitled to representation, to have someone representing them and uh, you know just kind of have their backs make sure that uh, they were looking out for their best interests as far as terms and conditions on a real estate purchase so if a home is listed on the open market through the MLS the seller is going to have a realtor and someone representing them in Maryland um, an agent cannot represent legally cannot represent both parties so if a, if a seller has a realtor and the buyer does not have a realtor, then that buyer is going unrepresented through that purchasing process. And some people choose to do that, that's okay, that's an option, um, but you know that's kind of how it works. So the state of Maryland stepped in and said, look, we wanna make sure buyers have protection, buyers have uh, someone looking out for, for their best interest. So that's something that, uh, that's just kind of how that works in Maryland. Now, it's free, it should be free, um, you know, for almost all of our, you know, the way our listings go in Maryland here is when a seller hires a realtor, they agree to pay a certain percentage of that 
uh, closed purchase price in commission. And that total commission is going to be split in some fashion uh, with the company that represents and brings the buyer. So uh, as a buyer here in the state of Maryland, you shouldn't have to pay your realtor a penny. Now, there's a few things that I want to uh, kind of let you know to look out for. Because if it's disclosed and if it's agreed upon or at least signed off on by the client, um, you can really charge someone anything, right? So that's something that you want to pay attention to if you're signing a buyer broker or a buyer agreement. Um, there's a couple of things I like to tell people to look out for. Does the realtor that you're hiring charge any kind of administrative fees? That's kind of the common term here in Maryland of what people charge, what agents charge on the buyer side and the, the listing side. Uh, it ranges anywhere from 300 bucks to 600 bucks, and it's just a flat fee um, on top of the commission that they're you know, getting from the, from the seller, uh, from that listing company. So that's something that I like to tell people uh, to look out for. Um, and then sometimes um, buyer agents can, you know, charge their client above and beyond in addition to what they're getting from the seller. So that's something that I always take a look for. So in Maryland, um, you know, like I said, we get paid from the seller. So just have that conversation to make sure that, you know, if that they're not charging you anything more unless you're willing to pay that, you know, so that's something that I always like to let people know to, to keep an eye out for. And one last thing when it comes to hiring a realtor, always look for what the termination clause is in the agreement that you sign. So, um, you know, this, this is important because if you're not satisfied, if you're not happy with the realtor that you hired, you want to make sure that you can quickly get out of that contract and uh, to make sure that you don't, you're not stuck, right? So some people, and this is totally up to the agent. So this is why it's so important to, to look for this because the agent can put in their own verbiage on that. So they can lock you in and kind of commit you to, to paying a commission or to be locked to them for six months, 12 months. Um, you know, so you can kind of do whatever you want there. So uh, for me, you know, I don't, you know, I want to make sure if someone's not satisfied, they can get out of that and, and go find someone that's going to be a better fit for them. So for me, I put immediately upon written notice um, from the buyer or the agent, right? So I want to, if, if I'm in a bad situation or if it's just not a good fit for me, then I want, I want the right as the agent to be able to cancel that agreement as well. So that's, that's the verbiage that I use just so just to kind of give you an example um, of how flexible this thing can be. So they can write in whatever they want there. So that's definitely something that I would uh, look out for as well. And then last but not least is going to be to shop your homeowner's insurance. So this is something that you're not going to really have to do until you get a contract on a home. Um, but once you do, homeowner's insurance is kind of the, the one main thing that you can actually shop for. Um, so that's something that I always recommend calling two, three insurance companies, probably starting with where you have your auto, just to make sure um, that you can kind of get a, get a fair price and make sure that you're not, not paying too much. I will say that on average, uh, for your typical single family home, you're looking at around 1500 bucks a year uh, for homeowner's insurance. If it's a smaller like town home, you could probably get that for closer to 1100 1200 a year. And then our walls in HO6 policies for condos here in Maryland, I'm seeing the average is probably around four, probably 400 bucks a year. So, you know, not, not too much. I know I work with a decent amount of Florida clients who are coming down from, from there and they're always shocked at how much more affordable it is here for, for homeowners insurance. So those are just like some ideas of what you can expect here as far as cost wise, but that's definitely something I would shop for. All right, everyone, thanks so much for watching this video. Hope you learned something new. And if you ever need anything at all, please feel free to reach out and we'll see you at the next video.